we're just going to note that Ryan is tying by hand today. So take it away, sir. All right. So I'm going to, I figured I'd start with the classic. Everyone likes the good old blue charm. So as you can see, my, <laughs> my flies aren't anything pretty. They're, they're fishing flies. So the wings are never married together. And so I'm starting with a extra small silver tinsel for the tag of this fly. And this is this this pattern is available in uh, Kelson's book and Price Tyrants for the uh, recipe. Here's my Bible here. So this is the book that I reference everything from classics fly patterns. So this has every recipe from every tire. And another really good book to read if you can get your hands on it is um, How to Dress a Salmon Fly by Price. Really good book. It's probably the easiest one to understand and, and interpret as English wise. Don't read the Kelson book unless you can understand Shakespeare. So your tag is normally from the point of your spear to your barb is normally your tag length. So some flies will have silver tinsel and then uh, a, a floss. So your, your silver tinsel tag would be five wraps. So always everything's done in fives. And then your, your floss would be the width of that barb or to the spear from barb to spear. So for proportions, that's the way I, I line it up. So I'm gonna come back here to where I need it to start. I am using uh, TechStream. It's a company from uh, Italy. I'm on their pro staff team and it's a traditional uh, twisted thread. It's pretty strong. So it's almost like it's the closest thing to silk thread that I could find. So I tied back, tied it in. And then I came forward and then I put a half hitch in. So you'll see me do a lot of half hitches in between and pausing because I can't, it just makes it easier to hold material. And I'll, I'll, use a, I'll use a pair of hackle pliers just as weight to hold stuff. And the thread that uh, I'm using, it's a six, six aught uh, thread. Threads are really hard to find and flosses. So you can see there I got that in. She's adorable. Yeah. I got her tying in hand now too. It's pretty funny. Uh, I think that's called child labor, Ryan, but we'll discuss that later. <laughs> so as you can see, I got that tied in there. I know it's hard to see. So then I, what I normally would do is I would tie that in and then um, this is the crest here. I know it's hard to see. See how it's splayed out? So to get that to splay out, I'll do it on a bigger one here for you so you guys can see. So all these feathers all have stems and you have to kind of learn each fiber is different. So some are oval stems, some are round. So you got to play with them to get them. So to get those to splay out, like this one's crooked as all get out, you can see. So you can straighten that. So you can see there, it's slowly starting to splay out. So some guys will soak these in water. 
And then what will happen is it will uh, always go back to its natural state, I find, when you do that. So now I'm tying in the crest. And the crest, I tend to bring it just past the bend of the hook here. And the reason for that is because if you have it any longer, it will foul up on the hook on you. But when you look at a lot of the vintage palette, they were actually super long tails, like William Blacker had really long tails on his flies. One of the other things I do is I, I V cut. You see how the cuts I've made there on the, the stem? So what you're doing is you're making a spot for your threads to bite into. See there, one side's long, one side's short. So all those long points are just creating, so my thread wraps will go in between there. And then I also, because this is a, a, a round stem, I have to, you have to pinch it with your fingernail to get that to sit flat so it doesn't spin on you when you tie it in. And that's the problem. A lot of these, fi a lot of these fibers will want to spin. Um, these are the worst to do because they're, they're, they're oval or round. So they'll always want to spin on you when you tie them in, even when you're tying in a vise. So it's always a good practice just to flatten everything out. So I'll put a catch in there, I'll straighten it out, and I'll wrap back, check it, and you'll see me. Sometimes I'll do this, and all I'm doing is because I don't have a bobbin, so that there is how I put tension on my line when I'm tying in. So you'll see me do that periodically. So I got that tied in. I'm gonna come forward now, some loose wraps. And I always start my fly behind this return eye is where I start. Because what I'm doing is I'm using the material to build up all that empty space so it, you don't have a, a lot of guys will get a hump right here in that. So I'm, I'm burying that in there. Here's a half hitch. And that will just hold my thread in place and I could play with this tail a bit. And I mean, as soon as it goes in the fly box, the tail gets mangled anyways. Or you lose it on a rock in Pulaska, New York. Okay, building on that question, even when I have a fly in a vise, I have pierced my hands many times. Does that happen to you when you're tugging or pulling or? Yes. In the beginning, yeah. or have you gotten better at it? In the beginning when I was learning and like, learning how to hold the hook and the right amount of strength, I have hooked myself in the beginning a few times that stuck in, but you're like, you're committed to tying, but you don't want to stop and it's sticking in and it keeps digging further and further. <laughs> so you kind of learn. Because at first, like when I first started doing it, I was like, I was like holding it super tight. Now when I hold it, there's like hardly any pressure to what I'm doing. You know, I'm relying on wax and really good thread are my two main key components to doing this. You have to have a good wax, sticky wax. So I use like Bailey's wax or this is like a cobbler's wax. This one's really sticky. So now it's medium tinsel, medium oval. This pattern is a, it, it looks simple to do, but it's pretty technical. Uh, a lot of people struggle with uh, bronze mallard. It's a really hard fiber to work with. So I'll, I stripped a little section there, just down to the white casing. You can see it. So what I'll do is I'll now bring that here. I'll put that on side on the bottom, put it in the catch. And I learned this all from reading old books. And for me to read a book, it's hard. So now I'm just building, building a body segment because this fly is a, a floss body fly. You don't want
want it to be lumpy. They're just so hard to sit and go through the whole thing. So I'm just using my scissors to kind of flatten everything out. How did you decide to start tying by hand? Uh, my buddy Whiskey Gin. Everyone knows Whiskey Gin. Um, he was friends with a, uh, a mentor of mine that I used to fish, I fish with a lot. And I got to see him tying in hand and I just was like completely in awe how awesome it was. So then I went home that day and I said, I'm going to practice that. Have you ever tried it with like a wine cork to hold it? Because I'm thinking our group probably has a lot of wine corks at home in COVID, you know. Yeah. Wow. You, could use, you could use a wine cork for yeah. sure. Just something to hold it. Yeah. Ryan, I saw that you, um, you're working with a piece of thread, not a whole bobbin of it. Have you predetermined the length of thread that you need when you're tying these ties, or do you just tie on extra thread as you go, as needed? Uh, yeah, at the beginning, I, I kind of would have to like, rip off a section and then tie it in, and then I'd be short, so I'd have to tie in another piece. But now I know exactly how much thread I kind of need to do what I need to do got it down to a science so normally when I'm when I'm done tying there's about that much left before I get to the head so yeah you can in the beginning until you learn your measurements you'll you'll have to cut and tie and cut and tie cut and tie it's it's hard because like as you can see you can see everything that's hanging off so you kind of learn muscle memory and everything how to keep everything kind of tucked out of the way when I first started tying a lot of my, I used to get a lot of hand cramps and this thread would wrap around that floss and this here would be not where I wanted it to be. And it was just a, a gong show. But now I know what to do and where to hold. And the best thing I found to do is I started tying on really small sizes. So if you, if you look at the old texts, a lot of the salmon flies back in the day were were small flies they weren't big so I don't know where this whole mentality of salmon flies have to be a size 3 hook come from because you look at the books and it says inch to inch and a quarter size hook that's not a very big hook it's floss yeah so again I've, I've, I've cut off a strip probably that's 10 inches or so in length and I'm, I'm wrapping. So I tied my floss in at the front and I wrap back to where my tag is. And I have had this before where I've gotten halfway across the body. It might happen here, it might not. I've misjudged my, my length and then I have to start all over again. So it's 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 pretty fun. To me it's like a challenge. And like the first time Brian seen me tying, nothing went wrong. Hey Brian, when we did the Tread Unlimited one, so that was good. And we're gonna be uber close here. You can see all I have left. I need my third hands here. I was only blessed with two. Oh, that's cutting it close. Three wraps to lock that in. That's when my hands get cramped, the body. Not so much on anything else, but on the body.
two half hitches here. So I always, the, the other key to success with this is your thread wraps, the amount of times that you wrap the thread. I try to only ever do three wraps to hold anything ever down. No more. Because you'll start to build too much bulk on your fly and then your head will get away from you. Head size doesn't really matter. It's just proportion. So if you have like, you know, a, a huge fly and a tiny, tiny head, it's unproportioned. That's modern tying. So now I'm going to, I'll tie this ribbing in. So five wraps of ribbing. It's hard to see. I need like a GoPro. And then you'll see that I was pulling, I was pulling pretty, pretty tough there. Um, when I first started tying, I would, I would pull and I would pull to the point where I would like break the thread all the time. But now I've gotten to the point where I know how much tension I can put on the thread that I don't need to worry about breaking it. And I always check to make sure my ribs. So there's the, Uh, yeah, at first, yes, I did. Um, again, it, it comes down to learning the materials and what you're dealing with. So I, I tend to run, uh, I like one ply floss for my bodies because you don't run into that much of a problem with the one ply. A lot of it's like multi strand floss, right? Like, um, Lagertons, I think, I think a four strand, I think. So you will run into that. Even even Lagerton, I, I kind of strip pieces off. I don't use the full amount for it. And you can cheat too. Um, back in the day when I was first starting out to get a nice smooth body for my first layer, you can you can wax. You can wax it a bit so it sticks together and it won't unravel. So now the hackle so i don't know if everyone i don't know everyone's tying experience what they what they have but to judge your length of your hackle you can hold the stem up to the center of the hook and that will give you see there see how you can tell that's going to be the length of my hackle i tied a knot 21 years ago and i got two kids out of it yeah <laughs> that's a good one can't untie that one. Yeah, that's funny. So you can see where the, there, see there how I cut that again? This is a better image of kind of what I was talking about. And I'll strip a lot of the one side because I want to reduce uh, the amount of stuff that's in this pattern. Because you got to remember Atlantic salmon flies were so overdressed that they never really sunk back in the day because the Atlantic salmon are kind of like a surface orientated fish. So you don't really have to get down deep for an Atlantic to have a take. And if anyone's wondering where I get my material from, I source a lot of my stuff from the West Coast just because it's more orientated towards steelhead than here. So I stripped that one side.
I'm just trying to fold it over here. I have a couple fibers. They're just really good old hackle plier. These were like the very first ones that I ever got when I started tying and they're the best ones. I've got so many pairs of these and like you said, half of them don't hold well. Yeah, these are just cheapies. Yeah, nothing special about them. The reason why the other reason why I do it in sittings too is because you start to get tired and then you make mistakes. It's like anything else, right? From this bend of this hook here to there, I have probably almost three eighths of an inch. So when I'm done, my head is going to be about a quarter of an inch, and I'm still going to have a quarter inch from the bend of this hook to my head. And the reason you want that is because these salmon flies were intended to be tied with a turl knot or a loop knot to keep your line comes through here. Fishing line comes through here like this. And that keeps your fly riding true when you're swinging it through the water. If you tie any sort of knot that hangs off the top here, like a clench knot, your fly is gonna wanna ride like this in the water. So always make sure that you have a space there for your your leader to grab onto to keep your fly true. So I get a lot and a lot, and I mean a lot of DMs, private messages on forums about the arch nemesis of this stuff. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to work with this. It is extremely hard to work with. It's extremely hard to tie in. Um, and guys get frustrated with it. So when I first started tying, you can cut segments off where you can leave like this fiber here. I could cut that stem there and I could cut that stem here and leave the stem attached when I'm tying it in and that will stop the fibers from splaying out when you tie it in. This here is the main key factor to your bronze mallard to make it look good. So you want more gray because that's softer. The brown is a little stiffer and it doesn't, it doesn't compress that well. So you always want to make sure that you have more gray than brown for your, for your wings. And this goes for spade flies or um, winged flies like this. Um, this. This is arch. That's the arch. The arch is now facing me. So the tips down is... Um, near side this is the arch here that's that side that's tips down that's far side so near side far side left to right um, there's no really right or wrong way to do it some guys tie tips up some guys tie tips down i'm a tips down guy so i'm just splitting this wing into three fibers three stacks here so i've cut off all lefts and I'm just kind of stacking them on top of one another to build a little bit of a thicker wing here because I'm on a bigger iron. Normally, if it was a smaller iron, I would just uh, do one quarter inch slip. So there's one wing. It's my far side. And you can alternate two. You can do one left, one right, one left. So then the fibers will never ever stick together. Or you can go, when you get into doing like um, your built wings, they call it, you can do individual strands of each fiber individually placed. That's that's 
George Kelson's way of doing it. So there's different, every tire has a different technique to his madness. So I don't know if you've seen what I did there. I kind of wetted the fibers. Sometimes they don't taste very good. So I'm, there's my two stacks. So when you're tying your wing in, always make sure that you only pull in one direction. So never pull towards you, never pull away from you. My first wrap kind of just holds it down and then my second one again is a little bit loose and then when i come back up i pull to the i pull tight to the top so what it does is it draws that feather down if you pull to your side or you pull away from you your feather is going to want to roll on you so there you have it there is the the wing fly normally calls for uh a you know, white bard so i just use a mallard flank but i have to buy normally four or five different bags to get the long stuff that I I want to use. So I'll just go to the store and clear out the whole rack if I go to a local fly shop and they have some good stuff. So when I call Michael, I say the Ryan Taylor 10% discount applies. Is that, that's what I heard, is a coupon? Or <laughs> I, I can give you guys a coupon code for Chinook Wind. I do have, I do have that. Yeah, we'll um, yeah, we'll get all the links later when we uh, correspond with you, and yeah. uh, including your uh, website for the artwork. Okay. Yeah. So you can see there. There's the white mallard sides. So now I'm tying in the horns. So I've just taken a piece of um, Parrot. If you have friends with parrots, make sure you get their feathers. So I just tied on that side. Parrot, yeah. Atlantis uh, or African greys? What species? Uh, this is a, a macaw. Okay. Because I actually have friends with parrots. My oh, parrots. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. If you can get, I'll show you. Let me just half hitch this in here. Oh, don't worry about that. Stick to the fly. And could you hold your hand up so we could just get a bit of a better view of that behind it? Nice. Thank you. If you can get the center tail off the macaws or the secondaries, um, they're really good. So red, red or blue. So I really take my time near this part of the fly. You know, I just have a, vi um, a visual now of you inside that aviary chasing around exotic birds, just like the book, The Feather Thief. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not far off. Do not cross line. And then you see, you read about me in the paper.
So I, um, horn placement is kind of cool because if you have a married wing fly, for instance, and you put the horn placement in the right spot, that fly will actually like vibrate back and forth. So if you run them down the sides, the fly will kind of flutter in the water. There you go. There's the... We're ready for the head now. So this, this would normally have another crest that goes on top of it. And I tend to stay away from putting crests on top because fishing for our fish species here, I believe that that stiffer fiber stops my wing from moving because the, the stem is hard. So I tend to leave it off. So here I put, I don't know if you've seen, I put a little bit of head cement on there now and I pack my head cement in the butts of those feathers because I'm a firm believer that back in the centuries they would they were tying by candlelight so what I believe a lot of the time they would have done is dip their bobbin their pin in candle wax and and touched up and used a lot of wax from their candle on their flies So I brought my thread to the front. So my thread is now brought to here. Because I'm gonna work my head back now and finish behind. So there, I, I finished that off. So the thread is behind that wall. Everyone see that? I wonder if this will show better. Does that show better? So now I'm gonna give it some wet finishes. That's it. So you can see here what I'm doing is I'm packing my fingernail in there. And you can see I've left a good quarter of an inch or so here on the front of the hook. So now my knot will sit right in there and it won't, it will ride true in the, when it's swinging. So that is that. Awesome.